from the Catholic Underground. Today on the show, let's talk about Francis, the saint, why Catholics need good movies, books for mom, the celibate among us, our picks of the week, and so much more. The Catholic Underground starts right now. Put down that ham. <laughs> it's time for the Catholic Underground, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 277. Yes. I am Father Chris Decker. If you are listening live, you can join us in the chat at catholicunderground.tv and get your chat on. Joining me this week, we've got Father Ryan Humphreys, the rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana. Hello, Father Ryan. Hello, world. We've also got Kathleen Lee. She is campus minister at St. Michael the Archangel Catholic High School in Baton Rouge. Hello, Kathleen. Well, hi. Also, Jeff Blackwell. He's the technical director of the CU. He is the commandant of the Jeff Star One Near Earth Orbit Satellite. He joins us on Earth That's right. this time. Hello, Jeff. Good to be here, Father. And Ed. Ed. Ed is on the ball with video for this broadcast. So if you're not watching us in video... You might want to give it a shot. Uh, we, we're on live every week, Sundays at 7 p.m. Central, and you can go to catholicunderground.tv and, and watch along with us. And then, of course, if you don't get to watch us live and hang out in the chat room, you can always catch us on the YouTube on the flip side. Okay. Well, it, it happened, and I don't know why it always seems to happen, but the Feast of St. Francis fell on a weekend, and so unless you celebrated that that Saturday Mass, right, uh, you didn't necessarily get to experience the Feast of St. Francis. But indeed, nonetheless, uh, St. Francis, uh, his feast was celebrated, God was glorified, and he continues to intercede for us. Father Ryan, the Feast of St. Francis is something that I often forget about, because whenever we were in the seminary, we were at a Benedictine Abbey that had the dedication of their Abbey Church on that day. <laughs> and so, and I hear they did it on purpose. Oh, I see. It was kind of a Benedict mm. over Francis thing. Yeah, that's what I've always heard. Uh, that's what the yeah, abbot told that's, me. That's the lore, huh? Yeah, that's the lore. But yeah, Francis uh, was uh, was is passed over a lot because in the the weekdays, unless you're a weekday mass goer, you just don't generally connect with him. And of course, you know. Uh, the Feast of St. Francis is a Basilican feast day for us here at the Minor Basilica mm-hmm. uh, because it is the secondary patron of our original church, the first oh. patron of our original church. So uh, it is a day of indulgence feast for us. And so we celebrated it up a little bit um, and, and we had a good time. It was, it was nice. a good crowd and good turnout. Now, most people uh, think of St. Francis um, in the manner of the little statues that you see in your garden. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I was listening to, uh, to uh, an encore presentation of Mother Angelica show as I was driving back from the Global Catholic Radio Conference in Birmingham, and she said, you know, uh, St. Francis was not really a, a what you'd call a handsome man. They say that he was, you know, kind of, well, you know, kind of ugly. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not like the statues that you see in the garden. And as it turns out, uh, whether or not St. Francis or, or, or Francis of Assisi was, was, was pretty or not quite a looker, he was a man, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and and oftentimes we we tend to get him painted in the picture of uh, of that movie from 1970s, right, Father? Yeah, I mean Francis was was a John Wayne kind of hoss, as we we say in, in Louisiana. <laughs> I mean this was a guy who who did it all, and and unfortunately in se- 1972, as you mentioned, Franco Zeffirelli uh, made a film called Brother Son and Sister Moon, and he went from being John Wayne to being some kind of bizarre mixture of Hugh Grant and RuPaul and Russell Brand and <laughs> just. You know, he just kind of went to this weirdo who frolics around in fields and sings randomly to streams. And um, you're not going to sing at me, are you? (laughs) Yeah, just you know, (laughs) you know, John Wayne would have looked at this guy and went, "Uh, no," just kept going. But I mean, you got to remember Francis when he had just a moment of being fearful about a leper, he jumped off uh, the donkey he was on and ran over and embraced the leper and kissed the sores. This is the guy who felt a little bit of lust in his heart and immediately threw himself into a bed of uh, thorny roses. This is the guy who traveled to the Sultan, you know, at the time when Islam was at its height and tried to convert the guy and said, you don't believe rightly. You know, this prophet of yours is an idiot. You need to follow Jesus Christ. Um, This is a guy who, who, heard the Holy Spirit and didn't know what to do. And the Holy Spirit said, rebuild my church. And Francis looked around and went, I don't see anything to do right this second, but oh, good bricks. I'll stack them up. Which he did. I mean, he, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And, and that's the thing about, about Francis is he was a soldier. 
you know, among other things, uh, he he was he was a uh, kind of the, the had the mentality of of I want to do what's right. Um, the the notion of chivalry of of knight knighthood chivalry was very much a part of who he was, and and I think that we forget that that his um his sanctity uh, while he was here on earth, his holiness was marked by the fact that that he embraced uh, what it means to be to be fully. Um, a, a man, right? Uh, to to lay down his his sword for his lady, the church. Mm. To to lay down his life for her, you know, in that sense, and to defend her. Yeah. And that's one of the thing those things that I don't know gets painted in in um, how uh, Lauren says in the chat room. Saint Francis is the patron saint of concrete statuary <laughs> and, <laughs> and nothing else, you know. But yeah, he was he was a man of action, right, Father. Yeah, I mean, this is a guy who he, you know, the Lord said, rebuild my church. And so Francis, you know, did what he could do. He, he rebuilt small chapels. And then he established not one, not two, but three distinct religious orders. And in his own life, those religious orders went to Wonky Town and he mm-hmm. reformed his own orders yeah. before he died. And then, of course, he bore the stigmata toward the end of his life. And the one thing he did not do, and I hate this so much, he did not say, preach the gospel always and when necessary, use words. Mm-hmm. Francis preached all the time. He was a, a very avid preacher, and uh, to the point where there, there are legions of stories about where people would not listen, and so he would turn around in a symbolic way and preach to animals yeah. who would pay attention, and that's how the bird ends up on the concrete Francis in your garden. Uh, you know, I mean, he is not some kind of, you know, fruit ball who's just kind of walking around frolicking like Laura Ingalls <laughs> in the field, saying, I'm having such a lovely day, <laughs> Say good night, John Boy. <laughs> you know this is this is a, a John Wayne kind of hoss um, who yeah. was a master of the spiritual life. And oh, oh yeah, we got we got one of those uh, times in which Father Ryan is frozen. Uh, but but Kathleen, this is one of those images of Francis that doesn't often get painted, does it? The, yeah, the- no. I I think I would love to have real like a real hoss Saint Francis statue in my garden. I wonder what that would look like. Like if, if you if you had to design this statue, Kathleen, what what would your statue look like? Would he be built like a linebacker? How'd that look? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, and he'd be like and he wouldn't have any like deers or birds. He would have like you know, mm-hmm. like like wolves and bears. Would he be panthers. maybe in armor? Maybe. Or yeah. maybe like maybe like John the Baptist in some kind of hairy. Oh like suit like a thing. like a camel. Skin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I, what I'm thinking. I, I think that somebody should commission that statue, you know? Uh, yeah. Father Ryan, we were just talking about how uh, how a statue of St. Francis should be designed today. Yeah, I, I agree. I heard about the, the camel, camel hair and, the, you know, I would, yeah, I'd be all over that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I, I think that, um, that it's important, too, that we see the saints as they were and not as perhaps hagiography or even secular hagiography has painted them. Right. And, and a lot of that can come from just reading the lives of the saints, but it all depends on who you read. Because, I mean, if you read some of the um, accounts of Francis's life, they're, they're really kind of frilly. But at the same time, not, not a one of the, the uh, biographies of St. Francis's life that I've read have, have shied away from the fact that he really dove in deep. And he brought about peace, but through holding the line of truth. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I think we forget, too. If you've ever been to Assisi... Um, and and I know Jeff and Kathleen. We hope to go one day with you, yeah. uh, but but Assisi is, I I don't use the word magical lightly, mm-hmm. but there is there is an almost unearthly sense mm. of peace there, and I don't know. I, I mean, I don't live there, so I don't know what the day to day is like. I'm sure that there are human beings there, just like you know. The, yeah. The, yeah. But there is an overwhelming sense that this place is set aside for peace, for rest. For, for rebuilding, and some of the most uh, beautiful experiences that I've had as, as a human being and as a priest have occurred in Assisi. Just, uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous place to, to be able to, uh, to lose your head and rebuild your head, you know? Mm, yeah. wow. And we'll be there in two weeks. And we will. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Fabulous. Yeah. You had Take a question pictures. about St. Francis there, yeah, I, I had never heard uh, that he had uh, a stigmata in, in later oh, yeah. years. In fact, how long uh, or how old did he live to be? Uh, he died in 1226 and was born uh, by, probably in his 50s, I think, give yeah. or take. Let me see. Oh, okay. When was he born? Right. Uh, 15 to 18 years before the, the century? I believe that's right. Yeah. Let me look it up. It'll be great. Okay. But anyway, about the stigmata, um, 
uh, yeah, the stigmata is one of those things that has a hmm, bad stigma in our world today. Uh, <laughs> but but the the notion that someone has has um, achieved that special grace by God, wherein He allows the wounds of of His Son Jesus Christ to be bore in in our human flesh, yes. and and so yeah. uh, Saint Francis received the stigmata as he was praying. Um, which are certainly not just the physical manifestations right. of the wounds of Christ, mm-hmm. um, and I believe he had all five of the wounds of Christ. Oh my! But okay. you also bear the physical manifestation of the pain as well. Yes. Right. yes. And so it, it is. It is a way that the Lord allows, a kind of a miraculous way that the Lord allows for us to enter into um, the passion of His Son, and so witness to the reality that through suffering comes joy, through suffering comes peace, through suffering comes resurrection. And I mean, we also know of other saints of uh, of our own time, like uh, uh, Saint Padre Pio, yes, uh, who who received the stigmata. And there are even those mystics in the world today that uh, that have either perhaps received the stigmata or have received um, a kind of a spiritual stigmata that don't have the physical manifestations, but they're permitted to experience the passion of, of the Lord um, in in the pain, but without the physical manifestation. And so those are things that are that are real and that are active. And that the Lord allows, not so that the person can be glorified. Um, in fact, that's a surefire way to never get a spiritual gift, is to just glorify yourself. Mm-hmm. But it, it is a way in which the church is glorified and God is glorified yeah. through the, the suffering of his members. Yeah. Well, thank you, Pilgrim. <laughs> in, in the, uh, before the Second oh, Vatican yeah. Council and the adjustments to the calendar, there was actually a separate feast day on September 17th for the stigmata of St. Francis, yeah. the imposition wow. of the stigmata. Okay. And uh, that, was, that feast was removed, but it's still one of my favorite feasts to offer the Old Mass for. Um, because the prayers are just beautiful. Yeah, and and we often, again, because our world shies away from pain and only talks about pleasure, mm-hmm. uh, we tend to think of of the stigmata as a bad thing. Yes, you know, and right. of course there are right. terrible movies uh, based upon that. But right. but the the notion that to receive a gift from the Lord, even if it is a gift that involves suffering, is is a great and beautiful thing. And feasts like perhaps the stigmata of St. Francis remind us that even though we as human beings may not receive the stigmata, um, there are wounds that we bear, right? There are wounds that we bear um, within our heart, wounds that are caused by sin, by our own sin, by sins that are committed against us. And there is a redemptive power in bearing those wounds and Mm. offering them back to the Lord. Amen. And that's what the saints show, like St. Francis, uh, in the physical manifestation of the stigmata, that we can bear wounds for Christ's sake. And in bearing his wounds, uh, we can also merit the resurrection. And those types of feasts are important for us to remember because, like I say, we don't have the stigmata, but uh, you and I and all of us, all of you out there, uh, we bear wounds. And we can either try and find redemption in the wounds themselves by holding on to them, mm-hmm. or we can offer these wounds, the, our suffering, for other souls, we can offer them back to the Lord. In fact, um, whenever Father Ryan and I say at Mass, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father, part of your sacrifice is offering those wounds to the Lord on the altar when you go to Mass. And there is real and, and manifold grace that comes from that. St. Francis was just one of those that uh, that the Lord allowed to show it physically. So. I love it. So Saint Francis, mm-hmm. uh, Saint Francis, a beautiful saint, and uh, and the Franciscan Order, they're doing so many good things around the world. Um, in fact, uh, there was a reformer of uh, the Franciscan Order in our own time, uh, Father Benedict Groeschel. A lot of you who who listen or watch EWTM programming uh, know of Father Benedict Groeschel. Well, he has gone to the Lord at long last. Uh, he died after uh, eighty-one years here on Earth doing the Lord's work. Um, in fact, uh, he was, uh, he's an author, he's a, a EWT and host, he's one of the founders of the community of Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, and he really is uh, a giant in, uh, in, in the church. Uh, one of the things that I remember about, about uh, Father Benedict is that he is actually, um, by, by discipline, a, a, a psychologist, a, a mental health professional. And right. so, so much of, uh, of his ministry... Uh, involved, uh, involved saying, well, this is how the natural sciences inform uh, our 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 spirituality, and he did it in a way that wasn't uh, that wasn't crazy, uh, like so many did in the '70s, but he did it in a way that was integrated, 
and a lot of people found solace in reading his books. He also had some really good books on spiritual warfare, um, on inviting the Lord in, and, and that sort of thing. Very, just a powerhouse. Uh, he founded the St. Francis House for the Homeless and Good Counsel Homes for Pregnant Women in Crisis. He um, directed uh, the Trinity Retreat House uh, in Larchmont, New York. He taught at the Dunwoody Seminary. I mean, this guy, a spiritual giant. He was on EWTN for 25 years. And um, talking about somebody who saw uh, a need for reform in the Franciscan order and kind of a new offshoot, if you will, of, uh, of apostolic outreach, and to say, okay, Lord, let's rebuild your church. And uh, I know, Father, I don't know if you've had an experience with the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, but uh, they're doing beautiful things up in, uh, in, in New England and specifically in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had some limited encounters with them when they've come down here for what used to be called Youth 2000. Um, and of course, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Father Stan Fortuna yep. is, uh, is a member of the CFR, and he was very associated with the uh, Steubenville South and the Steubenville conferences for a while. And so most of my interaction came with him and some of the brothers who travel with him. But a great group doing some very, very impressive things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. And Father Benedict soldiered on. In 2004, he was hit by a car. Mm-hmm. And, uh, in Orlando. He, yeah, in yeah. Orlando. He suffered uh, uh, bleeding and a heart attack. Uh, he had his legs and his ribs broken, and it was one of those things where, like, okay, it, yeah, it's going to take a miracle for this 70-year-old to survive. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he did. <laughs> it was, you know, he yeah. praised God for his recovery and just kept on hosting TV and kept on doing his thing. Um, and so uh, we, we, we give thanks to God for the life of Father Benedict Groeschel as he goes back to the Lord from which he came. Uh, he was 81 years old. Dear friends, you are listening to The Catholic Underground. We are online at catholicunderground.tv where you can chat with us when we're live in the chat room at 7 p.m. Central on Sundays. I'm Father Chris Decker. Father Ryan Humphreys joins us over the Skype waves. Jeff Blackwell is always here, like a sentinel signaling the dawn. And (laughs) Kathleen Lee joins us as she always does. She's a little sentinel. Oh. Hey, a little bit. Little she, bit. In fact, Kathleen, whenever whenever we're off the air for any period of time because yeah. uh, Father Ryan and I have something on the weekend or uh, or it's just we're having time off, Kathleen is always the one to say, we're doing a show? We're doing a show? Yeah. Mm-hmm. She mm-hmm. is the- Are we back? She is the most awesome cheerleader for the Catholic underground. So uh, if I, I can- I miss it. If I can pat Kathleen on the back, uh, proverbial, maybe for real. Hold on. Ah. Oh. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> That's lovely. That's so nice. For those of you listening in Radio Land, I just actually physically patted Kathleen on yeah. the back. Yeah. So. I don't think I've ever been, I've ever actually gotten a pat on the back. Yeah, there you go. Wow. You're welcome. So It's Kathleen, now documented. Kathleen. That's right. Kathleen is the official cheerleader for the Catholic Underground. Oh, so. she's also mm-hmm. the one that sent out the memo this week to everybody wear black shirts. Tonight, we did. We are, yes. we are all color coordinated. I don't have sparklies on my shirt. Well, you know, you got you to gotta get a little... You gotta get a little fancy sometimes. Even I mean, that ball in there has got a black shirt. That's on, right. So. Even that on the video has a, has a black shirt. Uh, everybody looks good in black, mm-hmm. but only only certain folks can can wear the white as well. Up, Absolutely. Uh, up top. Right. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. We you little wear bit white, I wear the sparkles. That's, uh, there you go. That's uh, right. That's right. Yeah. So <laughs> so Kathleen, a, a lot of CU fans, you know, the undergrounders, yeah, you yeah. folks, wonder why we spend so much time, and we do. Covering television and movies, yeah. and uh, Anna Abbott over at the National Catholic Register has some good new good notes about why Catholics need good movies. We talk about movies a lot. Yeah, we do, we do, and and it's good because to begin with, fiction in all its forms, whether it be poetry, novels, uh, stage, if you still go to the theater, and you should, I think so, and yeah. film, um, is capable of explaining and revealing truth. Uh, in ways that colder, more scientific methods lack. That's right. If we're just talking textbook, art always has the ability to take yeah. a textbook and make it leap off the page, yeah. right? I mean, if you've seen some 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 textbooks nowadays with you know with some really cool graphics, yeah. there you go. They've gotten a lot better. But specifically, um, art reveals the connection between truth yep. and beauty. Mm-hmm. Truth and beauty. And so when a movie or a book really gets it right, um, we have something like The Passion of the Christ yeah. or Father Elijah. Which we talk about a lot. That's right, one of those books we, we talk about a mm-hmm. lot. Um, that actually becomes kind of um, a spiritual reading or a spiritual um, aid if it's a movie. Yeah. Um, even ugliness as the absence of beauty can be used to reveal the world for what it is. Think of mm. uh, 1984 or iRobot. One of the things perhaps. that I remember about 1984, I don't know if you've ever seen the film. Um, I've, I've read the book. 
1984, of course, paints this, uh, well, George Orwell wrote, and we call it Orwellian yes. <laughs> right now. Right, yeah. uh, but, uh, but he painted this, this, this kind of uh, depressed world mm-hmm. that, is, that is overrun by, of course, Big Brother, you know. There you go. And uh, just completely godless. But there's a little yeah. twinge of hope in, in these, uh, these rebels, you know. But I'm I'm just thinking back in the movie now, long before color correction was a thing. You know, we, we nowadays we, we take a movie and we shoot it digitally, and then we put it in a computer, and we do all sorts of neat things to make it look gritty. That movie, in my mind, is one of the first that I don't know what they did to 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 the film to make it look really gritty and just yeah. depressing. But they did, and they did it really well. So much so that you go, man, oh man, I don't want life to be like this. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. you really entered into the characters, and art did that. Yeah, you know? yeah. It brought the it brought the the page off of the page and and made it into something that you can internalize. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So yeah, so when we have great movies or any other type of great art, um, we can preach without preaching, like good color correction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So favorites. Yeah, favorites. Do we have any favorites? I mean, I I really enjoyed 1984. Uh, I also enjoy. All of the old spiritual movies, too. Of course, 1984 is not a Catholic-oriented movie, in no, a sense, but it does no. paint. It paints a world as it is, and then a, uh, it begins to paint a world as it should be right. um, by negation. But I like a lot of the old uh, religious movies, like uh, like The Cardinal. Um, mm-hmm. My absolute favorite film, I think, is The Scarlet and the Black. That film. Oh, Jeff. I'm not Jeff, seen it's on that. The, no. We're going to have to put together a see you must watch yeah. list. Yeah, uh, and then get together one evening and have popcorn and sit there and (laughs) And we'll podcast it and we'll actually do it so that as we're watching it you can listen to father ryan and i that father we should do that we should do a riff riff tracks of this but maybe kind of breaking open things uh you know breaking open like i wow okay Mm -hmm. brainwave uh so uh let's see so so the cardinal the scarlet and the black Um, uh, the Shoes of the Fisherman, also a good film. Yeah, I like great. those old movies. That was great. Movie. Very, very much. Uh, th- those are just movies. But, Father, you like some poetry as well, don't you? Well, there, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, in poetry, my favorite is always going to be Divine Comedy by Dante. Oh, yes. Um, I've read it four or five times, and it's in, in differing translations. But it's it's just a, an incredible piece of, of literature and yeah. something that's in, just – it's very evocative. Uh, in books, my favorite book really is Brideshead Revisited, mm-hmm. which is um, by an English author, Evelyn Woe, who uh, is basically criticizing the the aristocracy in England. And yet at the same time, there's this amazing conversion at the end of the book, and it's, it's very, very edifying. Uh, in film, The Bells of St. Mary's, A Man for All Seasons – um, you know, there's just some great kind of true art and true art is cinematic kind of moments. Um, and, and those are some of my favorites. Yeah. When I'm thinking about the, these two words, truth and beauty, um, there is a really cool documentary called The Human Experience mm-hmm. by a group of, of guys out of New York. And they um yeah, Grassroots, grassroots Films, films yeah. which of course is uh, is uh, kind of an apostolic outreach of the Franciscan Fires of the Renewal. Hello. Oh, okay. they're, they're really cool. They're these these group of guys that were, I think they were kind of, they were like in a group home mm-hmm. growing up. And they just set out and, and they, they, they did three things. One, they spent the night um, in the streets of New York on the coldest night of the year um, and, and experienced what it was to be homeless. Mm. Um, and then they went to uh, Peru and worked in um, like a, a, a home for handicapped children. And then they went to... Ghana, I want to say, mm-hmm. and they visited a leper colony. And you want to talk about the beauty of the truth? Yeah. Like this was, it was really gritty. And I saw it before they edited it. They came to New Orleans and did a showing, and it was just really, really um, real. Yeah. Um, and they were just like, this is life, you know? And, and one of the guys was struggling. The, there were two brothers. They were struggling with their dad had abandoned them. And at the end of the film, he meets up with his dad, and it was this beautiful experience of like, he was struggling the whole ride there, um, but this beautiful experience of, of reconciliation. Um, and it was just just talking about what it is to be human. And it was mm-hmm. really, it's, it's a really cool uh, And that's what, that's what, and we say this a lot, uh, that's what good literature, good movies can do is help you understand the human experience. Yeah. And we really can't begin to understand how, how the divine, how God wishes to work with us. Unless we first understand our human experience, and and Father Ryan, this is uh, where we talk about the the 
the knowledge of the kerygma mm-hmm. that really helps us to to understand how God is at work. The first part we have to understand about the human experience is that we live in in a world that is fallen um, through through our own actions, through through sin that entered the world, through the hands of humanity, through um, through the the just the fallout of that, which of course is the presence of uh, of a fallen world or basically a fallen universe. And then we recognize the ways in which we are responsible for that. And then we can't do it on our own, and we have to turn ourselves over to the mercy of God. Good literature, good poetry, good films can help us to see that first part of the kerygma. They absolutely can. And they also put it in a way that is experiential the same way that Jesus taught in parables. Um, we ought not to understand that the parabolic, parabolic teaching of Jesus as something that's meant to be dumbing it down. It's meant to be integrating it in a way that is not necessarily our kind of bland scientism, um, but that is much more in the vein of storytelling, which is the way that basically all cultures before the, the 16th century did everything. Um, you know, even even Picard and what's his name at Tanagra, you know, storytelling is an essential part of culture. Yeah. That was a great Next Generation episode, by the way. Yeah, It's called Darmok. That's the name of it. And I had said I wasn't going to have any non sequiturs tonight, but there's a random Star Trek reference for us. <laughs> You're welcome. It's not even to see you later. You're welcome, Planet Earth. Planet Earth. <laughs> Earth. <laughs> Sorry, went Scottish there for a minute. <laughs> Do you have any favorite films, Jeff? Uh, really, my favorite of all time, and I like Gone with the Wind and some of the old classics, yeah. but uh, my favorite is... Only because, you know, Frank, Frank Capra was a director and he wanted to start his own film movie company called yeah. Liberty Films. And it produced one film and it wasn't really great at the box office in 1946, but Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed starred in it. It was called It's a Wonderful Life and it's become a classic as, as we know it over the years. But there's some there's some really good things in there about, you know, the day-to-day struggles, people making mistakes, the the mean old ogre who's, you know, is out to... Uh, to Basically, be selfish. Yes, that's true. And <laughs> yeah. um, and this angel Clarence, but we know that uh, uh, as as Catholics, that's not where angels come from. Yeah, but, but that's yeah, the, the beautiful thing. Of- that's the beautiful thing about good movies and good literature is sometimes you can bend those rules, mm-hmm. you know, to tell the story. Yeah, but it makes me cry, and uh, yeah. you know, I, I I just love it. It's it's a good heartwarming family movie, and uh, yeah, that's one of my all time favorites. And Father, would you say that that eliciting emotion is important in um, in in good literature that leads us to the Lord? I think that the good use of emotion. I don't necessarily know that eliciting strong emotion, mm-hmm. but when when a director makes a film, he has to kind of map the mood yeah. that he's trying to evoke. And there is a in, in all great great fiction, there is a sense of I'm in control of the mood. And so I may get somebody really excited or really sad, but even if I'm going to stay kind of in the middle, there has to be a sense where the author is saying, this is how I want you to feel. Um, Not in a manipulative way, but in a way of this is an important part of the humanity of storytelling. Yeah. In fact, in that vein, uh, we have uh, news that a new indie film company is trying to resurrect good storytelling. And uh, it's called Immaculata Pictures. That's the, uh, the, the group. Uh, and they are funding a Kickstarter to uh, to try and, and, and film, to finance their film, Call of the Void. And I haven't read a whole lot about this yet, but this is more perhaps of another indication of uh, folks trying to turn the Hollywood culture around, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so what we'll do is we'll have a, a link in the show notes if you want to read a little bit more about uh, about Immaculata Pictures, what they're doing. And then, hey, maybe if you want to give them a hand, you know, help them out. That's the beautiful thing about Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Is those sorts of things can happen. All right. Well, you're listening, of course, to the Catholic Underground. See you from the Catholic Underground. Well, we are the Catholic Underground, and uh, I'm Father Chris. We got Father Ryan, who's on Skype. He's always there. We got uh, Jeff, whom you know and hey, love, the voice yeah. of the Catholic Underground, and then Kathleen Lee. Hey. I just felt like we needed to let you know who we were in case you're joining us, uh, and. We, if you know one thing about us, we do like lists. And uh, our list of the week, we're going to have to make a, an audio tag for that. Our list of the week uh, this yes. week is five books for the Catholic mom's soul. And uh, Catholic moms are becoming a thing on the internet, right, Father Ryan? I'm, they, I'm just amazed. They really are. I mean, well, one of our friends, Catholic Sisters, Maureen yeah. Kreitzer, has a has a pretty good sized uh, group blog. And then, of course, there's Catholic Mom, Catholic Mom Blog. There's uh, there's a couple of moms on the National Catholic Register blogs. And so it's becoming a whole thing. 
Um, but at the same time, there's an area of concern that I've been seeing where we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater mm -hmm. uh, when Christians rightly reject secular feminism, yeah. which is being kind of revealed as more and more ridiculous, but they're not really replacing it. And Christian feminism is actually a thing. <laughs> um, it doesn't involve rejecting the same way that, that secular feminism does, but it involves really trying to say, well, what is God revealing through femininity? Yeah. And that's a big part of what John Paul was trying to do or St. John Paul was trying to do at the Theology of the Body. Right. Um, and so this, this list of five books is really designed to kind of give Catholic women in general and moms in particular uh, kind of the tools to be a Catholic feminist, whatever that means. Kathleen, would you call yourself a Catholic feminist? Um, I would. Yeah? Because I understand what it means to be a woman. She does. Oh, yeah. With and I've done, and I, you know, I've, I've been involved with, you know, um, some some theology of the body yeah. workshops, camps um, for a couple of years now. And it's, it's really interesting because, you know, when I was growing up, I was like, I'm a woman and, and I deserve things and, you know, woman power. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> now I'm. I just now I'm a woman. I'm a Christian. Yeah. I understand what the beauty. Yeah. Like, I understand that. Like when a guy opens the door for you, it's a, it's it's not a I can't do it by myself. It's a. He's respecting me and, right. and my femininity. That's right. So you don't need Erica Badu to tell you how to live your life anymore? Nope. That's outstanding. <laughs> no, indeed. That's outstanding, you said. <laughs> so uh, so what, what's, <laughs> what's in the list here, Father Ryan, who was not a woman? Well, uh, so so this is a list of five books. This is compiled. Uh, I should I should note um, by and well, I've just the page just closed. Isn't that great? Chrome, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is compiled compiled by a lady named Sarah Babs at CatholicLane dot com of, yep. of happy memory. Um, the first book she she recommends is by a priest named Charles Murphy, and it's called Eucharistic Adoration: Holy Hour Meditations and the Seven Last Words of Christ. Ooh, hmm. it's deep. And, but it's it's written, it's of course not written from a female point of view, because again, Father Charles Murphy, mm -hmm. but it is a remarkable kind of book that says, this is how we focus on and understand the role of all men and women, which is that it must start with the cross. It starts with, with looking at the Lord and being drawn into his cross. And so hugely important. Um, and, and from what I understand, a spectacular book. I looked it up on Amazon and spent some time reading reviews. Unfortunately, I did not have time to buy and read the book. Uh, the second is called A Handbook for Catholic Moms by Lisa Hendley. Um, Lisa is a blogger at National Catholic Register, and she has her own blog, I think, at Catholic Mom Blog. I do believe. Yeah. Um, and this is a book, it's subtitled Nurturing Your Heart, Mind, Body, and Soul. Uh, Lisa is somebody who does a good job of writing from an experiential point of view and combining that with the catechism, the scripture, and things like Theology of the Body. So this is going to be a, a strong book on a lot of directions. Yep. The third book is one that I, as a guy, don't get, but I think most of the ladies will have a, a kind of an, a, a, a visceral connection with, and it's called Weightless, mm -hmm. Making Peace with Your Body by a lady named Kate Wicker. Yeah. Um, and just the idea, th this is not really meant for, this, this is meant for people, uh, for women who give birth and then look at themselves after give birth, because that's that's a pretty traumatic experience for the body. Sure. And even if they've been skinny their whole life, they look down now and they've got some flab and they're retaining water and they're, you know, eating all the time because they're going to be breastfeeding. And she said that creates some pretty serious self-esteem issues, mm -hmm. uh, even in, in very confident women. Um, and so that book looks like it could be a really, really important book uh, for a lot of Catholic moms struggling with things they may not have struggled with before. Wow. That, that's, that's really one of those things that, I mean, as a guy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in fact, I, I've heard uh, female friends of mine say, oh, you guys, you can just take weight off however you, you know, yeah. you, you, mm -hmm. you just, you know, you don't eat for a day and you lose five pounds mm -hmm. or something like that. And, and, uh, and it's interesting because, uh, that doesn't become, uh, at least for most of the guys I know, a, a thing, and it doesn't impede our spirituality necessarily. But I can I can see where um, that would. This could be a really beautiful book. Yeah, I already downloaded it. On oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I mean, I mean, women like that. That to me, and working at an all girls school and being a woman myself who mm -hmm. struggles with weight issues, like that. To, that can make or break you if you're not okay with yourself. It can, it can hinder you in so many ways in your life. And, and you know, when you look at, um, you know, there are things that I've been diagnosed with that they're like, hey, 
this is why you struggle with your weight. I'm like, mm-hmm. duh, it's not even my fault. Like, you know, um, yeah. so, so and, and learning about yourself and why you are the way you are, you know, but Chris and I were talking earlier today and I said, I think some people are just like, born, when you say born that way, they're just born that way. They're born to be bigger people, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that then our society is not, is not, there's no press. It's, it's for not the, the truth. Person. Well, it's right. not, you know, yeah. it's not the truth. Everybody can be a size two. You know, and it's like, no, yeah. not, everybody not everybody can. And it's okay. Like, you have to, and women struggle. That's like number one. Yeah. Body image. Yeah. And and so the, the, the challenge is to say, okay, well, there there is a medium between between health yeah. and, and not health, yeah. right? And, mm-hmm. and being sickly. But at the same time, that doesn't necessarily have to square with, with this image of, of what a woman is because I see it on a magazine or yeah. something like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Well, and, and so much of that is, is tied in with our, our self-worth. Yeah. You know, what we look like, how, how thin we are, you know, what our hair looks like, it, how, yeah. what are we worth to people? And mm-hmm. it's, it's, you know. And, and that to me is, is one of those inversions of feminism yeah. that is thankfully can be redeemed in this notion of Catholic feminism, right? Yeah. This, this notion that, that I am beautiful because yeah. I am a child of God, yeah. and I am beautiful uh, no matter my size, mm-hmm. because I have worth. Right, and it it goes way way more way deeper than yeah. just. It has nothing. It has nothing to do with the way I look. Yeah. You know? So good. This looks like I might have to download this book. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the thing I find fascinating about it too, from the philosophy point of view, is that men tend to have a kind of a disconnection from our bodies uh-huh. um, just because the body is something that we use. But I mean, in a real sense, it's just not something that, that is, you know, well, it's hard to say not essential, but mm. I think you get the idea. Whereas for women, there's just a much more visceral connection with body. There, yeah. there is the the reproductive thing, which is much more involved than it is for men. Yeah. The bearing of children, of course, is so much more intense for ladies than it is for men. Um, and there's just there's a kind of a visceral connection with um, with the idea that that the the female body is designed to receive the gift of God, you yeah. know. And and it is of course the highest of the create the 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 embodied creatures. You know, Eve is above Adam because she's created after him. And so, you know, you have this whole much, much closer intimate connection between women and their bodies, I think, than you have between men and your body. And, um, and I think that that may have a, an additional part to play in why uh, most ladies have a very, very strong connection in terms of, of body image, yeah. self-esteem, and spiritual life, and certainly much more than any man I've ever met. Very cool. Yeah, so yeah. Let's, let's go through the next... Two okay, so here. continuing along, there's a book by Marge Fenelon called Imitating Mary. And this is neat because it has 10 chapters and it takes you through 10 Marian virtues. That And it talks about how moms can imitate these Marian virtues in the ordinary world they live in, which is sort of like imitation, for Christ, imitation of Christ, but for women, specifically yeah. in the modern world, which wow. is very cool. Neat. And then the last one uh, of the five is called 1,000 Gifts by Ann Voskamp. And it's uh, the subtitled A Dare to Live Fully Right Where You Are. Um, and this is the one book on the list that's not particularly Catholic, but it is not kind of mired in the tedious uh, self-help genre. Uh, it's a really, really remarkable book. And again, it's not one I've had a chance to read yet, but it's absolutely fascinating about her her desire to be a good mom and to infuse herself and her kids with Christian virtue and with a love for God in each and everything that they do, very much the little way of St. Therese. And so uh, this is kind of the the fifth book in that category uh, or that list, but it uh, it seems really fascinating. So five books that we strongly recommend that Christian moms take a look at or Catholic moms take a look at. Very, very neat. Uh, let us know what some of your books are maybe that you've discovered backchat at catholicunderground.com or you can go to our latest episode and uh and let us know what you what you're you're reading there in the comments box or let us know on facebook catholicunderground.com slash facebook from the catholic underground all righty moving into somewhat deeper water here uh it seems that that priestly celibacy has once again become a source of conflict and confusion as it probably always will and so we thought we'd take a few moments to take a look once again at what is celibacy? What exactly is celibacy? Um, and, and so just kind of diving into the, the first level here of what celibacy is, we understand it as physical continence, uh, 
Uh, and as, as Christians, it's not just the idea of being physically continent, but also combined with a spiritual focus, combined with, with a canonical discipline for priests. So there's kind of that threefold thing, right? It is, it is uh, choosing, freely choosing, not to use uh, our, our sexual uh, reproductive organs. Uh, it is a focused choice of uh, that being a gift back to the Lord. And then, of course, from the priestly perspective, uh, we, we also follow church law, and it is a discipline of the Catholic Church for priests who are uh, in, in the Roman Rite. Um, did I get that right, Father Ryan? That's perfect on the nose. Okay, good. So it's not required by divine law. This is one of those things that, that people often think that, that priestly celibacy is a dogma that must be believed for salvation. But it, it's not required by, by God's law, but it is an established intrinsic part of, uh, of clerical discipline here in the West. There are priests who do marry. And there are priests even now that, that have been ordained um, very recently, like with the Anglican Ordinariate, that do have a, a wife and children. But it is a really long part with a long history of, of clerical discipline. And, uh, and so that is kind of the, the overarching what celibacy is. But then, of course, we have to ask the question, why do we do it? And, Father, it comes from the Bible, yeah, I mean, it begins with the Bible. Jesus was celibate. The apostles were celibate. Uh, some of the disciples were advised to take up celibacy. And of course, in the Old Testament, we have a number of places where the greatest of the prophets were celibate. Um, you know, and so it's not in any way unusual to see a, in the scriptures someone who is taking up celibacy as an evangelical service of God. Yeah, and and that, of course, is time-honored also in the monastic traditions uh, you have religious orders of, of women, you have religious orders of men that take up not just a vow of celibacy, but or a promise of celibacy, but also a vow of chastity, uh, meaning that, that their entire body, uh, body and soul, everything is given as a gift back to God, and they choose to be, to be continent for the kingdom, which of course is the connection from Scripture. And, and we do believe, uh, certainly, that, that there is great merit in it, uh, because it's, it's witness. Huh? And, uh, and so it's, it's biblical, it's, it's traditional. Uh, biblically, was, was, uh, or I should say, celibacy was part of the, the basic notion of ordained Catholic ministry since about, well, really before 300 A.D. My. That's also one of the things that doesn't get a whole lot of press. Uh, right. Folks would just say, well, you know, Simon Peter had a mother-in-law. And, and we don't go any farther than that. But if you read any of the church fathers, the church fathers certainly tag onto that biblical notion of being, of being continent for the kingdom, of being a eunuch for the kingdom is the way that the Lord puts it in Scripture, in, in uh, reserving, reserving the use of, of, of your sexual reproductive power, which is a really, it's a power given to us by God to co-create with him, if you will. And so, um, and so we, we withhold using that for the sake of bringing souls to the Lord, for the sake of bringing souls to God. Um, and it's also time-tested in, uh, in history to be a good thing. And, of course, it's practical. Psychologically, logistically, it's a good thing. Uh, oftentimes, Father, uh, I, would, I will talk about, you know, if, if I have a wife and kids um, and one of my parishioners breaks their leg uh, and, and, and needs the, a priest or if they're dying, to whom do I go first? Yeah. You know. yeah, that's and that's a real difficult question on so many levels because if I if I've got some extra cash that I can donate to the parish or if I'm in a poor parish that needs me not to take my full salary but I've got the obligation to raise a wife and kids one the parish can't afford that that extra expense which doubles or triples the money I need but then two it puts me in a very difficult you know spot to to do how do I who do I help because I have a moral obligation to both at the same time that's right and so uh, that's the why. How? How does a priest maintain celibacy? Well, first of all, uh, human formation. Uh, there is a formation of the psychology of celibacy, that it is in fact not an unhealthy thing, as modern pop psychology would say, and that it also involves personal discipline, as Jeff and I were talking about before the show. Mm -hmm. It involves making a choice um, in, in, our, in our humanity uh, to, to exercise this discipline, you know, in the same way that, uh, and this happens all the time, I know I'm going to have boiled crawfish tonight, mm -hmm. and so I'm not going to eat all day. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save my stomach for, for uh, that, that uh, you know, pound or two of boiled crawfish I'm going to eat. You know, the, the, the notion of, of kind of a discipline, 
of a, of a saving oneself uh, so that a greater good can can come from from uh, from that that reservation. Uh, it's also a spiritual discipline. It requires regular prayer. Father Ryan, I know that you and I would agree that uh, that celibacy takes prayer. Oh, it takes lots of prayer because there's there's so much of being reminded the reason for for not just the small part of it. Because remember, priestly celibacy is part of a whole package. Yeah. You have priestly obedience. You, that's that's much harder, I would argue, than celibacy. Yeah. And you have uh, and you have all the other virtues that go into being a priest, and you know, the promises, and all of those things are constantly kind of bumping against you. And when temptation comes, there's got to be a sense of, Lord, why am I doing this again? Right. Oh, heaven, right, good. Mm-hmm. And we also believe, I was thinking about celibacy as a matter of fact today, that that this is one of the ways in which, as a priest, uh, the Lord has chosen me to glorify Him, in the same way that Kathleen, uh, should you ever marry? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we hope that it happens. No, I didn't mean it to be that. Anyway, don't Allah, cry. Stop Allah crying. That was cold. Uh, again, again, Kathleen, single and available. Yes. See you, I singles. Just, see you, single. <laughs> a wonderful What's Catholic up? woman. That's, That's right. right. And, yeah. and uh, but but Kathleen, should you marry, the way mm-hmm. that you will glorify God is in your bringing forth children yeah. with your husband. You know, mm-hmm. um, uh, Jeff, the way that you presently are glorifying God is in the raising of the children that the Lord has called into life, right? Yeah. Yes. And, and that's what we yeah. believe is that with, with the priesthood, uh, there, is, there is a real grace that comes in living this way of life and because it is glorifying God. It is possible. And then, of course, confessions, uh, going to confession regularly for the times that, that we fall, that we're, that we're less than, um, than, than perfect in our walk. And, and also in that constant notion that we are called to be disciples of Jesus Christ. So uh, there is controversy, right? There's controversy. Uh, the modern strain runs back, of course, to the, the 2001 reports of, uh, of clerical sexual abuse. And uh, we know, and, and science tells it really, really well, uh, as well as history, uh, celibates are far, far less likely to abuse kids uh, in fact, uh, things like incest and, and abuse happen within families uh, far more than they do in, in the situation with, with a priest. Um, but the myth is easy to maintain, and that's usually when the press picks up on it. So uh, really quick, um, and let's see what we can do in two minutes here. What do laity think of celibacy? What do you think, yeah. Kathleen, as a, as a— I think it's awesome. I think that, you know, um, that it's a, it's a discipline that, that is admirable. Um, I— and pro celibacy. That's right. And 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 do you do you see a value as as a layperson um, in your own spiritual walk? Yeah. Well, in, in 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 witnessing the ministry of priests who are celibate. Oh yeah, because for me, celibacy, you know, it it it, it leaves room for for not leaves room. It makes room for a desire for something greater. Greater. Yeah, which actually yeah. can point to the unitive aspect of marriage mm-hmm. too. Nope. You know, because as you know, uh, if you are unmarried, you yourself must be celibate. <laughs> True that. Thank you. you know? And so Kathleen, pra- uh, right now, is not the only, we're not the only ones practicing celibacy. Kathleen! Yay! Also join- celibate! <laughs> join the club! <laughs> See you singles! Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> so, so uh, uh, Jeff, is celibacy helpful for you? Well, the, the witness of, of of celibacy, and I never really understood it because this is one of these things I really have been thinking about these last few weeks: is how can a man, yeah, um, with all these temptations that come, your how I, do you do it? How do you do it? <laughs> right. And and I know that there there are things that I focus on. If I have these flashes that that just pop up from nowhere, you know, I immediately try to focus on the crucifix or Mother Mary, uh, and and just get my mind off of that garbage. But how yeah. do you live it day in and day out like that? So there, I, I, I admire you, and I know that it is a discipline. And uh, and as far as what celibate people think of celibacy, I tell you, and I tell people this all the time who who always uh, get into arguments first by saying, I think you should be able to marry. I'd be Catholic if, or the one thing I don't understand about the Catholic Church is why you can't marry. I'm thinking, you, can't, you don't want to be Catholic because I can't marry? And I go, you know, even if I could, I wouldn't. Because I've seen the great gift that comes from offering ah, my life there you go. for my ministry. I mean, I w- I'd be with the kids tonight. I wouldn't be on the radio. True. You know? That's very true. I'd be with the wife and kids. Uh, Father, I-, I think celibacy for me uh, is a great, great gift. What about you? 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there was a time in my life where I said, oh, oh, oh if only. But given the the workload, given the the kind of, of personality that I have and that I need to work with, and frankly, given the grace that comes to me every day in being a priest, um, I I would I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Yeah, and that I mean that is 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 really the the way that I would say that I feel too. I wouldn't trade it. Wouldn't trade it for anything. Alrighty, well, we have gone rather far afield, but I'm glad that we did. Let us know what you think about uh, about celibates in your midst. Backchat at catholicunderground.com is the way to do it. But, Jeff, I think we would be remiss if we didn't first go to that part of the show we call... The CU Pick of the Week. Jeff, you actually have a neat pick of the week that I'm going to have to learn more about. And I can't take uh, all the credit for it. Uh, um, a lovely, brilliant, smart woman who's director of religious education... Uh, at a church, uh, can I mention the name of it? Sure. St. Alphonsus Catholic Church uh, in uh, Central Louisiana. That's right. Um, was the one who showed me this uh, uh, outside the box video catechism. And we have uh, the links in the show notes, which you can find at catholicunderground.com. Uh, but uh, it is really, uh, these these are um, uh, really vi- video vignettes, if you will. They're short little videos that are pretty well done. They get to the point quickly. It's geared toward teens, and so youth groups are are, are just this is ideal for them to be able to um, you know to show a youth group some of these uh, videos. For the most part, they're entertaining and educational. And, it's and pretty biting too, man. I'm just watching the, the one on on uh, holy water. Yes. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, and and uh, so I mean, it's really steeped in that good Catholic tradition. Uh, there's uh, one on uh, how do I go to confession. Uh, which has some cartooning, which I know Father Chris loves. I do. And then I do like uh, the one on Holy Water you just mentioned. Uh, some that uh, aren't really blatant uh, in your face educational, but uh, they have a, a kind of a, a hidden message there that will speak to, I think, the youth. They'll, they'll get it quickly. So um, that's my pick of the week. Uh, it's uh, outside the box video catechism. Very cool. And this is basically, it says designed for youth groups, but it could certainly be used in your in your faith formation, your well, CCD yeah, class as that's well. Very true. That's really yeah. neat. Uh, cool. uh, Kathleen, uh, your pick of the week uh, yes. about TV, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if you're like me, I have been um, typing, writing in my calendar the um, the new premieres that are coming up. I've that's waited insane. all year. <laughs> and I, it, I'm really, it, I'm really am anxious about this idea that now the fall you know, mm-hmm. starts in October. Yeah. What? Yeah. No. The fall season, right? I don't like this at all. Now, I have been been, you know, satisfied by some good summer series, mm-hmm. but I, you know, I'm constantly going. Shoot, I miss this and I miss that. If you go to TVGuide.com, mm-hmm. they give you a calendar of every premiere that's coming up in the next month. Oh. It's awesome. That's handy. Nice. I need this in my life right now. It's because, also well designed. Yeah, and you know, if you go, if you go like today, mm-hmm. America's Funniest Home Videos is premiering. I didn't even know they were doing that. You didn't know but, they were a thing still. But let's go to. Um, <laughs> I need, none of these are really good. Okay, <laughs> the Flash this, is good. Yeah, the, I'm really excited about that. But you can yep. click on the show, and it'll bring you to a little, some little stuff on it. You know, some video clips and some interviews and. Really cool oh, right. It so it takes you, you to the show. It tells there. you what um, what was the, cha- the channel it comes on? Uh-huh. Yeah, the network. Thank you. Uh huh. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so that's my pick of the week this week because I'm I'm trying to get everything straight, trying mm-hmm. to line it up because Arrow comes on this week and Walking Dead comes on next week. No, oh. <gasps> I've waited. I, I, I've waited all summer. I kind of want to watch Arrow. Oh, you should. It's after. so good. good. I, we're way, I, way late, by the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're doing fine. Doing fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, tvguide.com. Yeah. All right. Uh, Father Ryan, your pick of the week. Mine is easy. It's a YouTube channel called Blimey Cow. Uh, <laughs> this is actually a, uh, it's a, it's a homeschool family, and this guy has got the sassiest, kind of saltiest way of looking at things. <laughs> it's hysterical. Uh, and he's got a bunch of videos that are just really tongue-in-cheek about you might be a homeschool family if. Nice. Nice. Um, it's it's really <laughs> funny. It doesn't seem like it would be, but the guy's kind of swagger, and he's got the homeschool swagger. If you know yeah. what that means, then you'll laugh. If you don't, you have to watch it to see it. But it's it's a really, really funny channel. And he's got a, a, a ton of videos. Of course, it's very free. Uh, so Blimey Cow, and the link is in the show notes. And, of course, he's a really talented individual, this guy. 
he really is. And the, and the production value is extremely high for something like this. Yeah, I, I'm just amazed at uh, the level of production that can be given to some of these things. And, and like, this is what you do, you know? And, and people actually make a, a, I don't know if he makes a living out of it, but makes a living out of it. Anyway, yeah. so my pick of the week is actually something that uh, I don't know how I'm watching, as I'm watching, but on the Disney XD app, you can watch it before it premieres. Uh, and it is the the new animated, uh, computer-generated Star Wars series on Disney XD called Star Wars Rebels. Uh, it, it basically follows the story, and I don't know where it fits exactly yet in the Star Wars canon, but I know it's probably canonical. And it follows uh, just right after the the, uh, the suppression or the, the death of the Jedi Order and uh, the, the overcoming of the, of the Galactic Empire. And this, this little ragtag group uh, that actually may or may not have a Jedi in it, even though they thought they were long dead. Mm-hmm. And so it's got some, some hints of, of the Firefly series, if you like that. Uh, it's got a little hint of Aladdin, you know, and that this little street rat kid is is uh, is, is cho- it, it kind of hitches a ride and becomes part of this Firefly like family, you know. So it's got some some uh, Whedon esque things. It's pretty funny actually. It's got some good uh, comedy, and one of the things I like is that it's uh, it's kind of done in the style of the Star Wars movie. So you have those neat little uh, wipe cuts and things and. And, and oh, quick cutting, really? so it it feels like you're in the Star Wars universe too. Even though it's, compu- I was amazed that I was watching the premiere, and I was thinking to myself, this is just like watching Star Wars. So they've actually been true to the the cinematic uh, reality of of that. So really, really cool. Uh, of course, it's called um, Star Wars Rebels. It's on Disney XD. It premieres, I think, this next week. But if you have the Disney XD app, apparently you can watch it. At least I was anyway. Wow. So that's that's my pick of the week. Jeff, our pick of the week for all of us always are those who donate and those who pray for us. Yes, absolutely. And also portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That's audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That's right. So many of you do, in fact, pray for us. Uh, and and it, it's hard to, to under, uh, to un, over, no, it's hard to estimate even even a little bit of what your prayers are doing, because they are. Uh, it just came back from the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Conference. And do you know that when people found out that the Catholic Underground was present there and that we had a show on, a, on our local Catholic network, we, had, we have fans. Really? We have fans. We have undergrounders that are above ground that were in Birmingham for this thing that are also Catholic broadcasters themselves. Really? And, uh, and so they said, oh, yeah, that Jeff guy, he's awesome. That Kathleen, <laughs> she is amazing. We're That's so angle. glad she's on the show. And the priest, you know, yeah. Father Ryan, he's, he's saucy and all that. And, you know, <laughs> so anyway. He's a curmudgeon. He is a curmudgeon. Yes. Uh, for all of the show notes on this episode on our podcast, you want to find out more about our apostolate, go over to catholicunderground.com. That's the place to do it. Father Ryan's church is online at minorbasilica.org. He's at FR Humphreys on Twitter. Father Ryan, thank you for joining us very much. Thank you for hosting. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Jeff Blackwell is the tech director of the CU. He's the ruling despot for the Blackwell Communications Group. He's at jeffblackwell.us and Jeff Blackwell is on Twitter. Thank you, Jeff, as always. That's me, and it's an honor and privilege, Father. Indeed, it is Kathleen Lee, the faith ninja at Kathleen Y-A-B-R. Kathleen, thank you. Anytime. She always keeps us, uh, keeps our nose to the grindstone mm-hmm. here at CU. And of course, you know, well, no, wait, Ed, Ed's on the, the camera feed. Uh, he tracks down mythical creatures that haven't paid their electric bill. And uh, you know me, I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. Join us on the interwebs at catholicunderground.tv for even more from the CU. Thank you for tuning in and hanging out with us on the digital continent. We're Catholic Underground, we're Faith Gone Digital, and we will see you next time. From the Catholic Underground.